And Cassandra Williams. Okay. He will be coming in in a little bit too. Okay. Well, we will get started. Uh, yeah. It is o'clock. It's eight oh one, and I like to reward those who here come early. Mike and Pam. Jesus. Well, we got a nice uh, full house. Say hey there, Mr. Mike. Um, anyway, we'll start off I, as advertised tonight's uh, tonight's um, session will focus on rejection. Uh, we're go going through strongholds. Last week we uh, dealt with uh, strongholds in general and the stronghold of fear, which Art Matthias calls a principality. Um, <clears throat> the one we're dealing with tonight also uh, is called by Art Matthias a principality. Um, and I agree with him. Um, I agree with Art Matthias about a great many things. Um, he's earned that, um, that status at our house and uh, making inroads into other people's houses too who are reading. There's two people on this call that are reading Art Matthias. Anyway, um, before then, I just want to get something um, mentioned briefly. Uh, we have a friend who's a deliverance minister uh, in another state, and he was working with a woman this afternoon, uh, and he was working with, with someone who had a great deal of witchcraft and Freemasonry. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I dealt with Freemasonry. Um, I'm putting it back on the table for now, for a moment, because of what he told us. Um, he was dealing with a woman who had uh, severe abuse as a child. Um, and she had DID and uh, tons of Freemasonry and witchcraft demons. Um, if all you know about Freemasonry is what the Masons tell you, uh, you only know a sliver. Um, what, what really shook me up was um, he said that the lady he prayed with today got a vision from the Holy Spirit of being dedicated as an infant in a Shriners ceremony. This is called SRA, ladies and gentlemen. And SRA is very serious business and it happens all the time, coast to coast and around the world. It is very serious business. Um, and I felt I, I had trouble even explaining what happened to me within a few minutes of reading his text. Uh, but our friend said, it seems to me like you had a prophetic vision. I almost feel as though I saw in the spirit what happened or I was in the room. I didn't see it, but I feel right now as though I've been affected as though I was in the room watching an infant be ritually abused. Um, it, it's, I'm very shaken tonight, uh, and I won't let that uh, shake up the class too much. But I'm saying this only to say is that um, Freemasonry, uh, you know, you basically have the Shriners who are known all over the world for being nice guys who do nice things for needy kids. And I'm sure a lot of good things happen at Shriners hospitals. I don't know. I've never been in one. There's one in Springfield, Mass, 10 minutes from the house where we live up north in the summertime. Uh, Christina, it's 10, 15 minutes from her house. You can go to Shriners Hospital. But anyway, um, if you deal with the fact that also the Shriners are doing SRA on infants, um, it's very, very chilling. And I have not been shaken like this maybe ever in my life. Um, what does SRA stand for? Um, satanic ritual abuse, uh, where an infant or a child is abused in a very dedicated, thorough, careful, and demonic uh, manner. Um, this is very often done in witchcraft gatherings, covens, um, satanic churches, and like other institutions. It also happens in Freemasonry gatherings. Uh, the Shriners are the top echelon of Freemasons. Uh, that's the top of the top. Um, only a select few, relatively speaking, get to be Shriners. You've got to jump through a great many hoops. Uh, this afternoon, um, this afternoon, um, 
went through some renunciation prayers uh, for Freemasonry. I was very much lightened. I took my own advice um, and basically followed Bill Suddeth's advice. Bill Suddeth is, uh, we have his books in our house now, we're reading them. Uh, he's the current president of the International Association of Deliverance Ministers. He's a real authority. He's worked at Brownsville. He's worked with Cleansing Streams. Um, he says that Freemasonry is so prevalent in Western Europe and the UK that if any of your relatives um, or extended family came from Western Europe or the UK, you ought to assume that there's Freemasonry in your background and you ought to go through the very thorough renunciation of the uh, do one degree at a time. There's 32 degrees. Uh, this afternoon, I went through one, two, three, York Rite, Scottish Rite, and 18th degree. And I felt this huge stuff lift off of me. I didn't feel burdened before, but afterwards I felt greatly lightened. Um, so this is the deal, folks. And, you know, when Nancy and I got into deliverance, uh, we started uh, multiplying Freedom Ministries two years ago. We had very little idea what we were getting ourselves into. We had no idea we'd be dealing with SRA, with DID, uh, which is to say dissociative identity disorder, formerly called multiple personality disorder, um, where these things, this happens when a person is severely abused or has severe trauma. The psyche in an effort to keep things together, splits off a piece of itself which absorbs the, the blow to the psyche and becomes a separately functioning personality. This is DID. And it often happens in trauma situations, especially in SRA and sexual abuse situations. Um, there's a very fine um, documentary done a few years ago. Nancy and I watched it. Um, it was like six episodes or so, a woman in her 30s who had DID. And she had been sexually abused when she was a child. And one of the ways that people deal with trauma and sexual abuse is by splitting off parts of themselves to, as it were, absorb the trauma so that the core person can still function. Um, this woman had a bunch of children um, and other stuff going on. So anyway, all that to say, um, just a reminder, uh, Freemasonry, Shriners, um, it, it would do everybody well. Any, anybody who's praying for people in deliverance, um, go back to the file that I posted in the files section of the um, deliverance heal, uh, help and discussion group. Um, on Freemasonry, how to pray, how to minister, how to understand it. There's a lot of resources online. Um, if you want more, email us, um, multiplyingfreedom at gmail.com, uh, Multiplying Freedom Ministries on Facebook, and um, Deliverance Help and Discussion on Facebook. If you're not on Facebook, you can go to our website at multiplyingfreedom.com. So anyway, that being said, we will move along to our tonight's featured attraction, which is um, strongholds, especially the stronghold of rejection, which Art Matthias in his very fine book, um, Biblical Foundations of Freedom, calls the principality of rejection. He puts fear, rejection, the occult, um, bitterness, self-bitterness, um, all his principalities, which are in his major strongholds, things that go beyond strongholds. So, as I said last week, strongholds are substantial outposts of the enemy and outposts of sin, outposts of habits that slowly develop in the hearts and minds and spirits of individuals who are dealing with three major issues. One is sin, little compromises, little, um, little accommodations, little bitty things that somebody knows is wrong, leads to bigger things and bigger things and more frequent and other stuff. Over time, 
a stronghold develops, which is to say there are deeper habits that um, develop, deeper responses develop to situations. And before you know it, there's a sin stronghold. It's not something that New Year's resolutions and a quick prayer at the altar with your favorite prayer minister is going to help. Strongholds need to be dismantled brick by brick through deliverance. You can do it by yourself, but it's most effective when you have somebody helping you. Um, another area is um, traumas in real life situations, especially relationships. If somebody is getting hammered by verbal abuse, they're having clashes and conflicts with other people, you are having situations where relationships with somebody are negative, they're hurtful, they're negative, they're demeaning. This is what leads to rejection. Uh, the other major thing that you see with strongholds developing is witchcraft and the occult. Um, somebody accommodating with either spiritual practices, um, religious beliefs, or other manifestations of alternative spiritual paths that are not blessed by God, which is to say, unless it lines up with the Bible, with the Holy Spirit, and with the Lord Jesus Christ being front and center, and any spiritual, um, you know, that any spiritual direction is going to lead you into bad stuff, either wrong beliefs, wrong practices, or straight up occult witchcraft manifestations and oppressions. Little things like reading this or listening to that or practicing this other thing can lead over time to a greater reliance to where the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and the Lord Jesus Christ are not the first place we turn for information, for wisdom, for direction. And before you know it, the Bible and the, and the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit are on the side, and this other spiritual thing has built a stronghold which largely determines direction and where people are going. So strongholds start small. Um, the verse that I chose for it in my uh, post from last week was little foxes spoil the vines. Uh, it's not big grizzly bears, hippopotamuses, tigers, elephants, lions and tigers and bears. It's the little foxes. It's the little mice. It's the little chipmunks that look so cute. And that, could, that thing couldn't harm a flea. Well, guess what? It'll lead you straight to hell, um, if not dealt with. So strongholds start with rejection, start with witchcraft and the occult, start with emotional responses. So where do we go with rejection? Rejection is one of the most common areas and problems we deal with in healing and deliverance ministry. We see it routinely. I've dealt with it myself in person. It is not easy. Um, uh, I'll bring in little crumbs of my own little story to just for illustrations. Um, reject, rejection involves situations where a person is given negative, demeaning, heart, hurtful, harmful, discouraging types of situations, and they respond, as most people will. Unless you are really astute and really are aware of what's going on, Rejection is very easy to happen. Unfortunately, rejection often can start in utero. Now, you hear us in this ministry talking a lot about things starting in utero, and some of people feel like, oh, that's a little extreme, isn't it? Well, I will tell you the truth. Um, just about anything that we deal with in real life deliverance is considered to be pretty extreme by the standards of normal churchgoers and many pastors. Um, and we can't apologize for that. Jesus was regarded as extreme, as was John the Baptist, as was Paul, and so forth. Um, the apostles were regarded as extreme, and so were what they did. So anyway, um, rejection generally involves sources and situations that come up very early in life. It can be an absence of love. You can have a household where love is not expressed, it's not given, where people are distant, parents are distant. Um, if the person is younger, everybody's distant. If the person feels like nobody loves them, nobody cares, 
nobody is making an effort to give love and affirm them, they start personalizing that and rejection is where things end up. An absence of love can be, um, let's say, um, you know, Frank and Karen have been sleeping together and they're not married. They both have, they're single or whatever, and they've been sleeping together. And then Karen says, guess what, baby, I'm pregnant. And um, if that pregnancy is not met with warm encouragement and affirmation, um, the little one who's growing inside does pick up on this stuff. If you have a family and they feel like their quiver is full and suddenly the pregnancy test comes up positive and the family leaders, mom and dad, feel like, oh man, our quiver is like so full. What are we going to do now? Oh Lord, help. No, 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 no. I'm not ready for this. Guess what? You're laying the seeds for rejection. Hey, Nate. <laughs> so rejection can start in utero. It can start with infancy. Um, adoptive kids. I have two adoptive kids. Why are kids adopted? Usually because their birth parent could not or would not bring them up for reasons that go all over the map. Um, personalized stuff. And oftentimes kids end up saying, I must be bad. I must be wrong. There must be something wrong with me. There must be something that is really weird about me because my mother couldn't, didn't want me or something like that. So basically what you've got is adoptive parents. Um, if you have factors where you grew up in a family where there's really no emotional communication and you don't have much affirmation of love and affection. I grew up in a family like that. It was a good family. We had a lot of fun. We had good experiences. But if there's no, um, if there's no love being expressed, if there's no affirmation, if there's no delight in the person being expressed, you can end up with a lot of rejection because kids personalize things. You can have hereditary rejection. Hereditary rejection is you have parents and grandparents and on up the line who carry that spirit with them and it comes down through the bloodline. Nancy and I are doing a lot of deliverance ministry where we are, um, we are gaining an increased appreciation for what happens in the bloodline. The bloodline is where the action is. The, the word of God says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Where does the blood come from? It comes from your bloodline. Your life comes from your bloodline. And, you know, the generational issues are the hardest ones for most people, not deliverance ministers, to understand and accept, but it's, it's reality. Um, if, you have a, um, if you have a child, you can have, a, you can have um, rejection coming out of fear fear of being hurt, fear of being betrayed, fear of being ridiculed, mistreated, and abused. The, per the person who has fear of these things can personalize it to the place where they feel like they deserve it, where they're bad, they're less than, they'll never be good, they'll never be anything. Um, we have a young man coming to us for deliverance, and he was basically was told for the first 10 or 20 years of his life by his father that he was never going to amount to anything He's just stupid and he's pretty worthless and, you know, not like his, his siblings. But um, if you ever watch what happens to kids or if you've ever been uh, on the receiving end of people who give you implicitly or explicitly the idea that you're never going anywhere and you don't have the goods, it's debilitating and it breeds a spirit of rejection. Another way that rejection can come out is you can get cruelty, abuse, and criticism, people uh, treating a young person, especially family trauma. If you have a child that's ganged up on by the rest of the kids, that child can end up with huge burdens of rejection because they feel like my parents don't care because they don't love me because if they loved me, they'd keep me from getting tormented by my brothers and sisters. You know, I grew up in a home where my parents split up when I was 10. I 
never consciously felt like anything depended on me or that it was my fault or anything, but hey, a lot of kids, they figure, well, it's got to have something to do with me. I grew up in a home. I'm not the only one where um, there was a, my, I had a brother. He was uh, seven years younger than me. Um, he had like mental retardation, like Down syndrome type of child. And, you know, then after a couple, a year and a half, he left the home. He was placed in an institutional setting. There was not too much discussion about what was going on. And that can feed a spirit of rejection. What's the matter with our family? What's the matter with me? What am I going to say to my friends? What do I say when people ask me, well, what happened to your brother? You can have deep roots of shame and doubt and fear and all kinds of other things that can turn into a spirit of rejection. Um, it may sound as like this is making a mountain out of a molehill, but if you've ever dealt with rejection or if you've ever ministered to a person who's carrying the spirit of rejection, um, you won't get that idea. Basically, what you've got is a person who's been wounded in some way, generally in a very young age or in a family setting, and what happens is they personalize and start brooding and dwelling on what happened to them, why it happened, and it leads to a very, very big uh, root of rejection. You can get um, self-rejection, where if a person feels like they're a failure, they're ashamed of themselves, they're ashamed of how they do, they're ashamed of how they look, how they sound, how they act, they're, they're, they get ridiculed by other people for how they talk, how they dress, whether they can play kickball at the, or whether they're a disgrace on the kickball field. You know, kids are very, very delicate. And delicate kids can really getting, get into a situation where they start having a very poor, negative, dark idea of who they are and why they are that way. And what this does is it breeds what can be a lifelong battle with rejection. I didn't get free of rejection until I was into my 60s. Um, I didn't even know about it. There are books written about it by secular and Christian psychologists, sure. But who's ever heard of this? I never heard of it. I'd been in ministry for decades and I never heard of rejection. I never heard of it as a separate thing that people deal with that's debilitating and which leads to demonic oppression. This is why it's important. It's not really a question of just, well, the kid feels bad, he's negative, you know, he's just got to shake it off. This is when you have rejection as a mindset, when you have negative self-image, when you have negative experiences that compound a self-image that I'm bad, there's something the matter with me, I'm a failure, not even God can love me. I don't deserve to be loved by God. I don't deserve to have a happy life. The enemy climbs all over that with the spirit of fear, spirit of rejection, spirit of anxiety, worry, um, doubt, fear, shame, humiliation, and so on. You ever see people, you, you like can't get them to have a good day. You ever run into somebody? They never have a good day. It seems. And even if they have a good day, they'll almost talk themselves out of it by, by afternoon. This is, this is what's often seen in spirit of rejection. It's very debilitating and it's very, very sad to see. Um, part of the, the biggest, one of the biggest things that deals with rejection is it's a, it leads to double mindedness. Now it is written. Double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. What does that have to do with rejection? Um, rejection leads to double-mindedness in these ways. Rejection is both an emotional thing and a spiritual thing. The emotional side of it basically runs like this. I need love, but I don't deserve love. I'm, my heart is screaming for love, but at the same time, I'm not worthy because I'm so bad or I'm so stupid or everybody thinks I'm a loser. 
So you've got this double mindedness of like, I need this, but I'm not worthy of it. I want this, but nobody's going to give it anyway. So why bother even wanting it? It can lead us to drive people away who want to reach us. This is typically seen in kids and young people. It's almost like the more love they need, the more obnoxious they are, and the more they push you away. This is, this is totally rejection. Rejection will work on a, on a person, often young people. Older people know how to be more, more subtle and, and smooth it over. But kids, you know, they're unfiltered. They just show you. Um, so the person really needs love. They're wounded. They're hurting. They're suffering. They don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to love. And at the same time, they've got these, these feelings that are just eating them up, but they figure they're not worthy and they don't deserve it. So this double-minded thing, the worse they need it, the more they push you away. If you're a parent, you've probably seen this either in your house or somebody else's house. Um, double-mindedness can lead, in the, in the worst case, to spiritual double-mindedness. Well, the Bible says God is love, and the Bible says God loves me, but I don't feel like God loves me. I don't feel like I'm worthy of God's love. I want God to love me, but since I'm such a loser, I know I don't deserve to have my prayers answered, and I don't deserve to have anything good happen to me. So maybe the Bible's not true, and maybe I, it, it, it's not even worth thinking about even wanting to get help because I'm just such a loser. I'm never going to go anywhere. Um, this can lead to people having such a hard time. They need love, but what do they do? They hibernate. They clam up. They pull into their shell, and they avoid people. They avoid situations. They hide. They dodge. They duck. They go dark. This is often the spirit of rejection. The more people need love, Sometimes the more they feel unworthy of it, if they're dealing with rejection, self-hate, self-bitterness, self-rejection, Art Matthias and his foundations of freedom, and it deals with um, what happens with people when they start saying self-hate. I'm I'm not worthy. I'm bad. I'm not good enough. Nobody loves me. I'm not worthy of being loved. I must be doing something wrong because nobody likes me. I must be really deeply in sin because God isn't answering my prayers. And there's just churning, churning, churning. This is the spirit of rejection. And it's almost a setup where people can set up where they're, they're pushing God away. They're pushing people away. And they're not letting anybody in to help them. Because they've never learned how to communicate and deal with emotions in the setting of a family that is, um, they've never dealt with it in the setting of a family that is healthy, loving, compassionate. They've, they've just never been there. So how are they supposed to know unless they've been in a family? Now, then where do they go sometimes? Well, I go to church. Well, who understands how to deal with rejection in the church? practically nobody. These people are not easy to get to know. They come in and they're broken. They're suffering. They don't have good communication skills. They're not smooth operators socially. They're socially awkward. They've got big baggage, big, heavy brokenness inside, and they don't know what to do. And much of the time, people in ministry at the church don't know what to do. How do I draw this person out? The more I try to draw them out, the more they push me away, the more they withdraw. I take a step to, towards them, and they took, to take two steps back. People in small group ministry, pastoral ministry, it's really hard. Now, it helps to understand what some of the, the symptoms are. So this is part of what's going on. Um, on the other hand, you can have people with rejection getting into attention-seeking behavior, but mainly it's discouraged, frustrated, guilty, hopelessness, inferiority, loneliness. You know, you see this in churches all over the place. You see it in any Christian setting. It's very rare to deal with somebody who's, gotten, who's never had a brush with a spirit of rejection. Um, 
It's really, really tricky stuff. Um, so it's 8.30. Um, let's take a pause for a moment and just um, see any comments or questions on rejections so far or um, strongholds in general. Sounds like someone we know, so we're waiting to hear the answers. <laughs> well, other, other thing, Bruce, is... Uh, you can know, you speak up a little bit, Mike, or adjust, adjust your microphone or something? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, sounds like this is uh, someone we know, and we're waiting to hear uh, the answers. What does is, what is the doctor prescribe? Okay. What does the Lord Jesus prescribe? The other thing, Bruce, is are you recording any of these? This one I'm recording. Um, what we are doing is we're getting ready to start putting up YouTube videos. Another thing that we're doing, uh, not everybody's on our Facebook page. <clears throat> I, have, I don't think I put this out on the website. Um, this Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, I'm starting a new series uh, starting from the ground up on rejection. I've been, I was asked, approached by an old friend in Europe saying, could you put something up that would be uh, early evening in Europe, which is 2 p.m. Florida time. Um, so starting this Wednesday, we're doing a 2 p.m. Eastern. It'll be 7 p.m. in the UK and Portugal, 8 p.m. in France and Germany. Um, they've already got a bunch of people ready to go and ready to watch. That will be starting from scratch. Uh, we'll be moving as quickly as we can to get into more substantial, but since we have maybe a dozen people from varying degrees of readiness and background, we're going to be starting at least at the beginning the way we did here uh, 12 weeks ago. This, I believe, is week, uh, week 13 for our, yeah, session 13. 13 weeks ago in February, we started this series. Um, and yes, um, I didn't come just ready to talk about deliverance, but to actually uh, get into what do we do about it? Because multiplying freedom, we believe in not only doing deliverance and talking about it, but helping people actually minister to people who are hurting. Um, thanks for your questions, Mike. Anyone else? How do you help somebody with their emotions? Like you said, the emotions, um, they're not able to handle, like if they have a spirit of rejection or maybe even fear, how do you help somebody who you recognize their emotions are not, um, you know, the way they should be? Well, you're getting into uh, something we talk about from time to time. The old fashioned, old school deliverance ministry basically meant you came to somebody who had a deliverance ministry, you got prayed for, something happened, and then you were done and you went off and, you know, go your way, be warmed and filled. And what happened afterwards was not the concern of anybody, maybe their church. But what we're learning, what we do in Multiplying Freedom is we look at the whole picture and we say, the person's situation came about because of how they were brought up, where they were born, what happened to them. When we do deliverance, we, we give them a, a detailed questionnaire and we say, describe anything traumatic that happened from ages zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15, and 20 plus. So if you have, the reason I'm saying that is in this situation, you're dealing with a situation that's going to take time. It's going to take love. It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take investment. And so let's say you have a friend, if you're, if you're Mike and Pam or you're Denise, and we say, okay, I know this person, this is exactly what they're dealing with, or so it seems. Now, I guess what I would say is number one, relationship is key. If it's somebody that you already know, relationship development is where you want to be because all good communication and ministry flows out of relationship. The deeper the relationship of trust that you can build, the more that person is going to be able to open up their feelings and describe what's happening. If they don't know how to talk about their feelings, you're going to have to help them. If they don't know how to pray about things, you're going to have to help them. I can't, when I was dealing with deliverance, with uh, rejection, I already knew how to pray and I knew how to get into the word. And I read this book, which is John Eckhart's book, Destroying the Spirit of Rejection. 
I recommend it wholeheartedly. Eckhart is one of the finest writers in the world on deliverance topics. This is an entire book of 175 pages that's devoted to rejection. How to deal with it, how to minister, how to affect it. If this is a, a, a area of strong interest, if you see a lot, you cannot do better than to get this book. Um, I am getting no money for recommending these books, by the way. Uh, I do recommend them enthusiastically. So getting back to your question, we've got to deal with relationship. You've got to deal with time, helping this person explain what happened to them, why, why they think it happened, what they believe happened, and then we have to help them understand what are the spiritual dynamics of rejection in the first place. So that leads us into the second um, half of this. Um, that's a very good question, and we will get into that in the course of this uh, part two here. Um, anyone else before we get into the nuts and bolts of what do you actually do now that you recognize that that's what this person is dealing with? Anybody? Anyone feeling bold well, and courageous, or they just need to get something asked? Well, I just, I just want to say that um, one of the things I keep, the thing I keep hearing uh, where it concerns me about my grandchildren and uh, they were they were put into foster care for a, a year and uh, I, I would think that would also oh. be At one of those things. Very strong risk factor. For yeah. Thing, issues related to rejection. You can't say it's absolutely going to produce it but they I would say they're they're at high risk and um, what we're going to want to do is definitely reach out to them as much as you can, emphasize to them, you are there for them. You are always thinking about them. You're always praying for them. Take every opportunity that you can to connect and love, love, love. Unconditionally, you know, be the good, be the good guy and be the grandpa who... Grandpa always had always told me I was special. Grandpa always told me I was beautiful, you know, or whatever. And and show it. You know, take opportunities to be with them, take them places, whatever you can do. You know what they're dealing with. They're dealing with feelings of what's the matter with me that I'm here? What why is my life not worth anything since I'm getting subjected to this experience? What's the matter with my parents? If there's something the matter with my parents, there must be something worse matter with me, you know, and so forth. You, what you can do is you can, you can compensate somewhat for that. Yeah. So just know that your job is extravagant love, affirmation of how important they are, how amazingly awesome they are, and how much you just think they're the greatest thing in the world. So, Let's say we have somebody who is, uh, we, we feel has a spirit of reje rejection on them. You really want to, you want to try to find out as much about their life, their formative years, what happened to them, where were their traumas, misunderstandings, harsh words, experiences that could have shaped them. You want to have prayer lined up for them. These people need intercession. I mean, anybody that's getting ministry from church, from if you're in any kind of prayer ministry, counseling, teaching, discipling, whatever, we all know about how important intercession is for who you're dealing with. But what you've got is have people praying for them. What you want to be doing is looking for um, how to focus on what's going on actually in their life? Why do they feel this way? A lot of what's coming on is that they've taken life circumstances and personalized them. They've taken life circumstances and they have turned their interpretation into something's bad about me. I'm wrong, I'm bad, I'm a failure, I'm no good, there's something the matter, there's something the matter with my family, I'm ashamed of my family. I'm ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed because I can't make my family look good. I, you know, it just goes on and on and it spins. Understand that the thought life is critical here. Basically, 
the other things that we need to do is help people understand that um, the reason they're feeling what they're feeling it, to a large extent is they have responded to situations by blaming themselves, by blaming God, or by pulling back from God, by pulling back from others. The number one thing that they have to be understanding is that this, the, the whole deal with rejection, it's people taking their thoughts and their emotions and turning their interpretation of life into something's the matter with me and turn it into self-hate, self-bitterness. What this does, now you've got sickness and disease coming in. Um, autoimmune diseases, inflammatory conditions, very commonly seen. Um, you've got stuff like um, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, all kinds of, you know, these kind of things are very, very commonly seen in situations where rejection is happening. What you need to do is start getting them into the word and help them to digest and personalize the word so they start lining their thoughts and feelings up with what God says about them. People who have rejection they're paying attention to their feelings or they're paying attention to the words or actions of others and not paying attention to the word of God to the same extent. They're perceiving themselves as being bad, rejected, and what they're doing is they're taking those things and making them what's determining their feelings. So what they need to start doing is understanding that they have to... Up they have to understand their feelings of anger, bitterness, brokenness, fear, rebellion, sadness, self-pity, shame, and realize these things are here because of things that I started thinking and feeling many years ago. And people need to repent of things. They need to repent of paying attention to negative emotions, to negative words from others, to negative thought patterns and start soaking in the scriptures. Soaking in the word is, is so critical with fighting rejection. Um, a lot of churches and ministries are doing things relating to you know, our identity in Christ and, and all of that. That's critical for dealing with rejection. You, they have to help the person understand and see that they're dealing with a lot of self-bitterness self-hate, self-anger, negative emotions of shame directed at themselves, self-criticism, judging themselves, self-pity, manipulation, emotional immaturity. One thing that you often see in people with rejection is perfectionism because it's a way of compensating for rejection. Well, I'm, I'm not that good, so everything I do has to be perfect. Sometimes perfectionistic people are people who have a deep spirit of rejection. Many times people with rejection have a very arrogant, haughty, proud, critical spirit. That's a me defense mechanism. And I, I have people very close to me that are dealing like this. Not my wife, Nancy, thank you, Jesus. But I have other people in my life who I've had to deal with. Kids are, are very often seen in young people where if they're dealing with rejection, they'll come across as very like self-assured, arrogant, proud, self, you know, they're the, they got it all together. They're the hot stuff. They're doing this. They can, they can come across like that, very haughty, very cocky. And many times it's very obnoxious, but many times it's a cover for feelings of rejection and fear. So when you're dealing with rejection, this is, I'm talking about, this is all the, the counseling part, the talking about part, the praying part. We'll get into the deliverance part too. But you've got to help people see that the emotions that they're feeling and the way that they're acting is coming out of woundedness. It's coming out of pain. It's coming out of trauma. It's coming out of negative experiences that they have had 
over many years time. And what they need to start doing is forgiving people who hurt them. Nobody that comes to, in, to our ministry for deliverance is exempt from us asking, okay, we know that you don't, you say all your relationships are squeaky clean and they're in great shape. Is there anyone in your life, if you ran into them at the supermarket today, would you have a little like tightness in your gut or a little check in your, in your mind or your emotions give you a little like, ooh. Um, anybody who has hurt this person, offended this person, or affected this person um, negatively or has produced any unfavorable emotions or with whom they have unfavorable relationship that's not peaceful, there need, there's a deep need for forgiveness. I had to do this many times. The most important thing they need to do is forgive themselves. Many people with rejection, they've personalized, they've self-blamed, they've self-shamed, they've self-criticized, and what they need to do is realize you need to forgive yourself. You need to let go of the shame and the regret from all your failures and all your sins and all your problems, and I know there's a lot of them, but you can't change any of them. What you've been doing is carrying them and they're churning and they're eating you up. And you've got to forgive yourself and move on. You can't carry fears and frustrations and guilt and hopelessness, inferiority. It'll, it'll eat you alive. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how good your coping skills are, nobody can do this. This is why Jesus said, you must forgive. And the pe people sometimes that have the hardest forgiveness, self. We had a woman who's in our ministry not long ago, and I, I was speaking with her, we were praying, we had a team with her, and we said, you know, you've been through this, you've been through that, you've had two failed marriages, you've had an abortion, you, this has happened, that has happened. You need to let it go and forgive yourself. And she just broke down on the spot. Get out the tissue box. This is what, this is what sometimes people need to do, is they need to be able to look back and just let go of everything that's happened in their life, whether they're 22 or 72. Many times people get to be my age and they've never learned how to let go of their past, release it, get forgiveness, get it covered by the blood of Jesus and forgive yourself. If you don't forgive yourself, you, will, you won't get past the spirit of rejection. <laughs> Plus you'll be violating the word of Jesus. When he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Our self, it, loving yourself is not being self-centered. It's not being prideful. It's being healthy. It's understanding that I am who I am because God created me. So we need to help the person to understand God's love, to experience God's love. Try an extended prayer time where they pray through scripture, personalizing scripture and putting it in the first person and pray with them. Hug, if it's, you know, a woman with a woman, hug them, hug them a lot. Um, up north, we're part of Nate and Christina's church. And Christina, when she says, honey, come over here, and she'll wrap them up in a hug. And these women just break down because Christina loves on them with a hug and just said, it's gonna be okay, let's pray. And the, I've, seen, I've seen people just break down and that's where sometimes the biggest healing comes. We need to be able to love them and help them feel the love of Christ through us. If we're talking, but we're not loving, what's the good, what's the use? First John says, let us love not in word or in tongue, but with actions and in truth. We need to help people understand who they are in Christ and help them experience that. That will probably mean lots of prayer, lots of time, lots of love, lots of tears in the tissue box. Help the person get healed from traumas. People have gone through lots of traumas. Even people who think they've had an easy life, help them understand 
that once you know what's happened in their life, help them understand that this was a trauma. That was a trauma. We're not going fishing for memories, but no. If you know about something, you look into their life and you help them see, this was traumatic. We need to pray over this. You need to help them understand how to process their past, release people, forgive people, forgive themselves, let go of guilt, let go of shame. There is a psychiatrist in a major psych hospital and he said, if, if my pay, 80% of my patients at this psych hospital could walk out of here tomorrow if they would learn how to forgive themselves. And this guy probably wasn't even a believer. Help people to forgive, really forgive. Forgive the unforgivable. This can only be done by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit. To love the unlovable and sometimes help people to love themselves because oftentimes they don't feel lovable. Now, Help them to pray and pray a prayer of repentance for rejection. Here's what Art, here's what Art Matthias um, does. Christina has this book at home. Dear Lord, I ask you to forgive me for the fear of being rejected, for rejecting others, for rejecting myself, for desiring rejection. God, forgive me for the ways that I have affected myself and others. I choose to forgive myself for any aspect of rejection, self-hate, self-anger, self-bitterness. In the name of Jesus, I cancel Satan's power and authority over me in this issue. And because God has forgiven me and I've forgiven myself, I command the spirit of rejection to go. Now, part of the thing that's happening with um, spirits is you're going to want to do deliverance. If you think you are able, it's not really not that hard. Once you've prayed for somebody, you've helped them to forgive themselves and forgive others. You're going to want to cast out any spirits that God shows you. I'll give you a few that are very likely to be present. Spirit of self-accusation, depression, perfectionism, pride, fear, Paranoia, indecision, passivity, lust, guilt, spirit of infirmity, spirit of doubt, rage, anger, self-rejection. Things that come upon people because of the ways that they're thinking and feeling that have opened up a door for the enemy. So some people are on here, I don't, I don't know too much. Some people here I haven't met before. But some people are going to be comfortable doing this. Others aren't. That's okay. If you have somebody who's dealing with the rejection and you help them understand why they feel the way they feel, why they think about themselves and others the way they do, how to release self and others in forgiveness, release and affirmation, how to receive God's love, and how to pray through and forgive themselves for rejection, self-criticism, self-hate, you will get people mostly free and they'll, they will feel like they've never felt in their life. That's what happened to me. If you feel comfortable addressing spirits, demons, sure, you say in the name of Jesus. After prayer, after the word, after everything, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over spirit of addiction, spirit of despair, spirit of envy, spirit of guilt, get out in the name of Jesus, spirit of hopelessness, spirit of inferiority, spirit of rege revenge and pride, shame, suicide, unworthiness. In the name of Jesus, get out. I mean, that's the deliverance side of it. So basically what you're doing is you're love the person, talk to the person, develop trust, help them explain what it is they've gone through, why are they feeling the way they feel, what has their life been like, where are the hurts and traumas, why do they not feel confident? Why do they not feel like God loves them? Get them into the word, get them under prayer, get them into more love and affirmation, help them to personalize scripture and pray it so that the scripture starts changing their mind and their outlook and um, do some deliverance with them. 
take authority over these spirits. Pride, rejection, fear, anger, worry, depression, doubt, infirmity, indecision, passivity, double-mindedness. Just say, get out in the name of Jesus. This is not complicated. Um, we've covered a lot of ground tonight. Um, the spirit of rejection is something we see routinely. Um, I've dealt with it myself very deeply. I'm not 100% out of the woods, but I've made some progress over the time that I've been dealing with uh, deliverance ministry. So um, let's hear it. Any questions or comments or uh, things that I'd forgot to touch on? Are you going to put these up on a website, Bruce? Are you going to have a YouTube channel? I mean, this is pretty good stuff. Uh, thank you. Uh, there will be a YouTube channel, yes. Um, and I will write something up for the uh, website on rejection because it's such a critical issue. Um, like I said, if you're the studious type um, and you don't mind spending a little money, uh, let's see. Um, I don't see how much this book cost. It might be $15, but John Eckhart's book, Destroying the Spirit of Rejection. Yeah, it's $14.95 on Amazon. $14.95 on Amazon. I'll tell you, Eckhart is such a thorough writer. He's so insightful. He will give, if, if you read this book, it'll help you with a lot more than rejection. It'll help you with, Mary, with different aspects of deliverance, prayer ministry, and understanding people. And you might even see a little something about yourself in there that you recognize that God will help you get free of. And that'd be certainly worth 15 bucks. Um, this, book was the, this book was the book that I was reading when the Lord really got through to me and showed me, wow. I was reading it in this very room and, and I was like, whoa, whoa. And I just said to Nancy, wow, wow, I, I need this. And that's when we started deliverance on this. Um, Denise, how's, how are we doing? Do we touch yeah. on- Yeah, yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you about um, generational uh, um, yes. rejection. Like if you're trying to help, um, a family that you know has like the autoimmune diseases commonly in the family yep. and those type of things. Yeah. Okay. The bottom line, short version is generational issues in your bloodline. Um, it comes down, you've got DNA, ching, 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 DNA comes right down the bloodline. Also spirits come down the bloodline. Those are not so nice to think about. I, I like to think that I got some of my wonderful qualities from my parents and grandparents. I also got some not so wonderful qualities. So if you know that you're dealing with, or you suspect that you're dealing with generational issues, what you do is you find out what you can find out about the generations. You pray and you ask the Holy Spirit to teach you and show you stuff. Um, there's a, there's a um, file on the Deliverance Help and Discussion Facebook group that uh, was written by Arlen Epperson, and it um, deals with generational issues. It's very, very fine. Um, Epperson wrote for Randy Clark and Global Awakening for many years before he went to be with the Lord. So generational issues, you just, you just say it out. Um, I would also recommend doing Freemason, Freemason re-renunciation prayers. Whether you think you need it or not, I didn't think I needed it. I went through First, second, and third degree, Master Mason, York Rite, uh, Scottish Rite, and uh, 18th degree renunciation prayers. It took about an hour reading them out loud. And I'm telling you, I, I, I felt like lighter and freer. It was like, wow, I feel like five or 10 years younger. Serious. Mm. Um, so generational issues, you just say, in the name of Jesus, I break all generational bonds with my ancestors. I break soul ties. I break off any effects of spiritual, emotional, mental, or physical afflictions, infirmities. I break the ties of Freemasonry. I break ties of rejection, addiction, lust, whatever it is, witchcraft, I break those ties. I break my agreements with them. I renounce them. I renounce any ways that I have come into agreement with them or I have dealt with them or let them establish any foothold on me. I take back every bit of ground that I have given 
to spirits that came into my life through generational lines. I cleanse my bloodline in the name of Jesus. Very important. I forgive my ancestors for their sins, their wickedness, mm. their crimes, their witchcraft, their occult involvement. I mean, you think of two sides of your family going back five, 10, 15 generations. No, nah, that's not going to be squeaky clean. There's stuff back there that's very dark. You want to say, I forgive them. I release them. I hold nothing against them. But I cut myself off in the name of Jesus. And I draw a bloodline between me and my ancestors with respect to spiritual oppression, wickedness, and sin. I put the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ between me and my ancestors. I put the empty tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ between me and my ancestors. And I cover mm. my life with the blood of Jesus. And I seal my life, every opening portal, open door, foothold, stronghold that the enemy has used. I cover it with the blood of Jesus and I heal it in the name of Jesus. I explicitly renounce any sinful practices of my ancestors. I explicitly break my ties, connections, and agreements with them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I declare myself to be healed and free from all of them. What you're going to want to do then is you're going to have want to look internally and, and go through a very careful self-inventory and say, as it is written, Lord, see if there is any wicked way in me. Help me to look in my life and see what I've got lurking in there in the dark corners that I never saw before. Nancy and I are in deliverance ministry. People bring to us the most horrific things that you could imagine. We're still having stuff brought up by the Holy Spirit out of our own hearts, out of our own guts, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, out of the deep recesses of our memories, things that we never, that happened to us 50 and 60 years ago. I'm serious. And the Holy Spirit says, it's time. And he brings it up. We're not going fishing like, you know, some kind of weird visualizations or weird psychology. But if the Holy Spirit brings it up, you better deal with it. Because the Holy Spirit knows you can handle it or the person. If the Holy Spirit brings it up, he knows that the person involved can handle it. It might be with fear and trembling, but it can be done with grace, prayer, intercession, and lots of love. Lots of hugs, lots of affirmation. Um, we're, we're up at uh, 9.04 now. We like to wrap up around 9. But any uh, anything I haven't touched on or didn't explain well enough? Bruce, I would just say, uh, just on a personal note, one thing that I dealt with along with uh, my issues of rejection was like um, almost like a religious accusing spirit, like the mm, yeah, accusation yeah. of the enemy that would yeah. constantly... Um, tell me that I wasn't doing enough or that yeah, I wasn't yeah. doing the right things. It was almost like an accusing, lying, you know, religious spirit because I had a background with a, a certain level of faith and had come to Christ, but I had some deep rooted rejection issues um, that made my whole approach to uh, coming before the throne of grace as one of, of, of coming uh, to the Lord in, in fear of, of what I had done wrong and what, what, he was going to say to me or what, what his response was going to be to me. And, and, uh, this, it was like this double edged sword of like having enough understanding of God and, and faith and religion to know that I needed him. But, um, at the same time, so much rejection that I, you know, was afraid of what I was doing was sinful and wrong. Um, and that, uh, you know what I mean? I, I couldn't change myself, but you know what I mean? Uh, it was just like this awful toxic combination yeah. of like having enough understanding to know that God was real and, and that, you know, Jesus could save me, but coming at it from this totally toxic perspective of like, I, I had to change myself. Right. And I had to like come to this reality of, a, of acceptance of like, only you can change me and you do accept me as I am, even though I'm coming to you as a sinner, you know, I, I am saved by grace and not by works and, and that I just had to give up that whole burden of like, um, oh, yeah, save myself. This is, 
This is seen so commonly. I've lived this. <laughs> People who are dealing with rejection, they're trying to compensate for their perception that they're unlovable or inferior or not good enough. They compensate by being mm. a, in going into a performance orientation where they, they're, they're, they're the excel, you're gonna be, you're the, the champion performer at work. You're the champion performer in the office, on the sales force. Um, these people are often very driven. They come into ministry and they're driven. They're driven, they wanna be there, they wanna do it all, see it all, learn it all. They want to perform so because that will reassure them that they're worth something and they're looking for the approval and affirmation of others because they've never got it in their youth and they've never discovered how to get it from God. So what do they do? They're trying to get it by being busy, being performers, and being perfectionists. And this is, this is seen everywhere. You, see, you look at any church, you'll see this. You look at many workplaces, you'll see this. You look in school, you'll see it. Now, the antidote to this is understanding that you're dealing with rejection and all of its kin, understanding that the answer is getting to know your father on a more, um, getting to know your father on an emotional level, getting to know your father as a lover, as someone who hugs you, holds you, affirms you, and is wild about you, so that you don't have to try to show anybody that you're loved. You don't have to show anybody that you're something in God's kingdom because your father's telling you that you're something in God's kingdom. Your father's telling you that you're somebody special. Now, we work hard for the Lord out of our love for him. If we have a healthy relationship with the father, we work hard. We put our whole life out there for God but we're doing it not because we're driven by some need to prove something or feel something because we've never quite got there before, but because we're offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to the Father and pouring ourselves out as a drink offering to other people, as Paul said. But Nate, what you said was, was very apt, and I've lived it myself. But what, what heals is helping the person get to the point where they've experienced the love of the Father, where they experience the love of Jesus, where the Holy Spirit is, as it is written, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. The love of God is soaking into us from the Father by the Holy Spirit and transforming us. And if you've ever had an experience where you feel like God is melting you with his love, you know what I'm talking about, or you feel like, this is what happened to Dwight O. Moody when he got filled with the Spirit. He, God just poured out his love into Moody's life. Moody literally had to say, please stop. I can't take it anymore. Um, this is the, the, the fix it for a lot of rejection is getting people in touch with the love of the Father, getting them in touch with the love of Jesus to the point where they don't have to prove anything to anybody because they walk around and they're just walking in the love of God. They're secure because they know they don't have to be somebody special to be loved because they've understood. And, and Mike and Di Denise were talking about how do you help someone come into this? Well, it's like you teach somebody any, teach people anything else, baby steps. Teach them how to understand feelings. Teach them how to understand thoughts, how to express love, how to express feelings, how to live healthy and do things for the right reason instead of the wrong reason. And it, it's, it's like bringing up kids. It's discipleship. It's ministry. And this is why I like to say that pastoral ministry and, and deliverance ministry are not two different things that belong in two different worlds. They're two parts of the same ministry of the, of the Lord Jesus. Disip the way we do discipleship is we bring in pastoral counseling and care and discipleship deliverance, prayer, healing, in, in, in varying proportions depending on what the person needs. And good pastoral ministry and good discipleship ministry recognizes when prayer and healing for trauma and hurt and when deliverance are not, it's, they're not 
they're not like, oh, well, we don't talk to them because they do something different from what we do. In, in a healthy church, we realize that we're, we're all parts of the ministry of Christ and we need each other and we help each other. So it's uh, 10 past nine. Um, and I think it's just about time to uh, sign off unless anybody has a very pressing comment. Um, we will uh, wrap up for the evening and I'll put something out on our uh, website on rejection this week. And uh, we'll work on another stronghold next week. Um, strongholds are very important things and uh, we'll be dealing with them one by one. Uh, do follow up on our website, multiplyingfreedom.com. Questions, you can email them to multiplyingfreedom at gmail.com, Facebook, Multiplying Freedom Ministries, and Discipleship Help and Discussion. Uh, we do uh, do deliverance on Zoom. We live in South Florida. Um, we do deliverance a lot. We do it on Zoom, just like we're doing tonight. Um, and we do pray for people and our site. If you have suggestions for things you'd like to see on our website, see on our Facebook page, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we love to know what people are thinking and feeling. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, and um, thank you, Cassandra. Um, and Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Uh, if you know people um, in Western Europe or in Africa, um, in Africa, I think it'll be like 9, 10 p.m., uh, in uh, West Africa, in Western Europe, it'll be 7, 8 p.m. starting this Wednesday, two days from now, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to start a series, um, um, Deliverance Ministry from the Ground Up. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on the basics unless we really need to, but we will be trying, I don't know if we're going to catch up to this class on Wednesdays, but we will be uh, moving right along. So God bless you, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for your questions and suggestions and everything. Lord willing, we'll see you next week. God bless you.